Good morning, I'm Jana Greenwood, and I'm going to do the reading today. So uh, grab a Bible in front of you, or um, if you have a device that you prefer to use, get that out right now. We're going to start with um, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 15, and then we'll move to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. So reading from Romans. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one who believes with the heart and so is justified, and one who confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one who, of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And then reading from Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 12. Therefore, let us go on toward perfection, leaving behind the basic teaching about Christ and not laying again the foundation, repentance from dead works and faith toward God, instruction about baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits, for it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away since on their own they are crucifying again the Son of God and are holding him up to contempt. Ground that drinks up the rain falling on it repeatedly and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and on the verge of being cursed, its end is to be burned over. Even though we speak in this way, beloved, we are confident of better things in your case things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not overlook your work and the love that you showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. And we want each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end so that you may not become sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience Inherit the promises. Look all the now on video cassette, one of Disney's all-time animated favorites, The Jungle Book. It's the unforgettable story of the boy who was raised by wolves, befriended by a bear, only to end up in the wildest adventure of all. It's a tale filled with excitement, surprises, danger, and fun. Walt Disney's classic, The Jungle Book. All right. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, kiddos. And once again, welcome to Topeka First United Methodist Church. You are joining us for the first of a three-part sermon series that we're calling At the Movies. And so as Allison mentioned, uh, on Friday night, we gathered as a church family in Fellowship Hall. We had pizza and popcorn and snacks, and we gathered around and watched The Jungle Book so that I could preach on it this Sunday. Uh, next Friday night, we're going to watch the first Incredibles as a church family, and that is conveniently just in time for the second Incredibles, which comes out that weekend. So you can come watch the first one, get a recap, and then on Saturday night, go watch Incredibles 2 and have a whole weekend of Incredibles. That's my plan, at least. Uh, and the third week, we will watch The Little Mermaid, and Jeff will preach on it. And I found out that there's a, a new Little Mermaid coming out, so we have predicted all these new movies coming out because we're just that good, I suppose. Um, the Jungle Book. It is an old and classic.
classic story. It originates from Rudyard Kipling, the British author who wrote the book in the 19th century. And since that time, it has been remade into many movies and many TV series time and time again. And we love The Jungle Book because of the story it tells. It focuses around the man-cub Mowgli. And Mowgli is abandoned in the jungle as a young boy after his parents are killed. And he is found by Bagheera, the Black Panther. And Bagheera takes Mowgli to the wolf pack. And the wolf pack opens their hearts and their homes to Mowgli and raises him as one of their own. But not all is well in the jungle for the little man-cub. There is a villain to this story, the evil, merciless, and lethal tiger, Shere Khan. Shere Khan hates Mowgli, not because he's met him, not because Mowgli did anything to him, but simply because Mowgli is a man. And this tiger does not like human beings, and so he vows to hunt and to kill Mowgli. So the wolf pack gets together, they have a big boat, and they decide for Mowgli's best interest, we have to send him back to the man village in which he was raised so that they can protect him and he can live out the rest of his days. And so he and Bagheera go back into the jungle to find the man village, and that's where the adventure really begins. In the jungle, they meet all kinds of fun and fascinating characters. They meet Ka, the ball python that tries to hypnotize Mowgli and Bagheera and wrap them tight in their coils, but Ka is continuously failing to do so. They meet Blue, the big, lovable bear that becomes a close companion and friend to both Mowgli and Bagheera. They meet the envious King Louis, the king of the apes, and he is jazzy and fun, but obsessed with man's red fire. He wants to know how he can make fire so he can take over the jungle and rule over it as the king of all creation. He's a greedy monkey. And of course, time and time again, they encounter Shere Khan. At the end of the movie, Mowgli defeats the tiger, banishes him from the jungle, and returns to the man village to live out the rest of his days. And as I walked in this morning, I had a few people say, you know, Austin, I've never seen The Jungle Book. And I reminded them that it's a 120-year-old book and a 50-year movie, so there aren't spoiler alerts anymore. That time has long passed, so I know I gave the ending away, but you've had a few decades to watch it if you haven't seen it yet. It is a wonderful tale. And there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the Jungle Book. When I was in Tonganoxi at the Methodist Church there, we did a whole sermon series on the Jungle Book when the new, new live-action remake came out. So it was hard for me to boil a sermon series down into 20 minutes of talking with you today. But I want us to focus on one of the many messages that we find in the Jungle Book, the way in which the characters grow throughout the story. It starts with the wolf pack. Bagheera grabs this random baby boy that he found in the jungle, goes to the wolf pack and says, here you go, raise him, won't you? And the easy answer for the wolves would have been, no, he's going to grow up to be a hunter. Human beings out of the village, they come and they hunt all the animals in the jungle, or he'll build a village and that will destroy a piece of our habitat. And Bagheera, you know that we just had cubs of our own. We have our own family to take care of and to worry about. This is not our responsibility. But that's not what the wolf pack does. They open up their hearts, they open up their family, and they open up their home, and they welcome Mowgli in, and they are heartbroken when they have to say goodbye to the man-cub because he's not a stranger. He's just like their son. Baloo, the bear, grows a lot in the movie, too. When you first meet Baloo, he's fun and lovable, but pretty aloof uh, and a little bit selfish. He lives by the mantra of the bear necessities. He thinks that if you just wait around and are are kind of there, life will happen to you and good things will come. You don't have to work hard for anything. And he's much more concerned about his well-being and his happiness and his life than he is anyone else's. But by the end of the tale, we see Baloo putting himself between Mowgli and the tiger that wants to kill him, willing to sacrifice his life for the man-cub that he has grown to love so much. That's incredible growth for that bear. Bagheera grows too. He starts our story as the hard-nosed authority figure in Mowgli's life, and because of the way he handles situations in his quick temper, he and Mowgli fight quite a bit. And when they fight, they separate, and then they both find themselves in trouble in the jungle. And when Bagheera first meets Baloo, he does not like the loose and free-living bear. They are very different people, and they don't get along. But by the end of the story, Bagheera has softened around the edges a little bit. He and Baloo become steadfast friends, a friendship that stands the test of time, and they work together to keep the man-cub they love alive. And Mowgli grows a great deal in the story, too. 
He starts out as a bit of a brat. He pushes back against authority figures. He doesn't listen to the people around him. And he fails to see why he needs to leave the jungle. And he's mad that everyone around him is telling him he must leave. But by the end of the story, after he's fought the tiger and seen the world around him, he gains a better understanding of the sacrifices that the characters in the story have made to keep him safe and happy and well. And he chooses willingly to go to the man village for his own sake and for the sake of the jungle. And so what we find throughout the Jungle Book is the characters we love, the characters we root for, the characters we try to be like, are the characters who exhibit growth. And in their growth, they build relationships that last their entire lives, and they make the world around them a better place. And in that understanding, understanding that when we grow, we build relationships and make the world a better place, I think a message remains for us as Christians today. The texts we read this morning remind us of the call as disciples of Christ to grow continuously in our faith. I want to start first with Hebrews. We read from chapter 6, verses 1 through 12, and Hebrews is a fascinating and somewhat mysterious text. It's mysterious because we don't actually know who wrote Hebrews. Over the years, some have tried to say that it's another book by the Apostle Paul, but no real evidence exists for that argument, and so the author remains a mystery, possibly just lost to time and to place. And it's fascinating because it's unlike most books of the Bible. It's not a gospel, it's not a letter, it's not a prophecy. It's a sermon written by the author of Hebrews to a church that in his eyes had stopped growing, maybe not numerically, but spiritually. Now, I must admit that Hebrews can be a harsh text. It has been weaponized over the years by pastors who have grown angry at their congregation and at their churches. And I want to be clear that that's not why I picked it today. I believe that we do great ministry here at First United Methodist Church, and I also believe that Hebrews is not a harsh rebuke of a congregation and an angry pastor beating his hand against the pulpit, but a message of encouragement and a push to grow as disciples in which the author shows us why and how we are called to do that. So one more time, if you will, either in the Pewback Bible in front of you, on a smart device, or on the screens, lend your heart, your mind, and your attention to the words of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. Therefore, let us go on toward perfection, leaving behind the basic teaching about Christ and not laying again the foundation, repentance from dead works and faith toward God, instruction about baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits. For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, since on their own they are crucifying again the Son of God and are holding him up to contempt. Ground that drinks up the rain, falling on it repeatedly, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless, and on the verge of being cursed, its end is to be burned over. Even though we speak in this way, beloved, we are confident of better things in your case things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not overlook your work in the love you showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. And we want each one of you to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end, so that you may not become sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Therefore, let us go on toward perfection. A powerful reminder here in Hebrews from the author that as Christians we are not called by Christ to a passive faith in which we start this journey and stay at the same place and never change and never grow and never evolve, but we are called to an active faith in which we are called to grow deeper and stronger and more convicted as disciples of Christ. In those beginning verses, the author is saying to his audience, look, many of you have been Christians for a pretty long time. And I know that you know the foundations upon which your faith is built. We don't have to rehash this every single week. We don't have to go over the same things time and time again. You're not called to just know the foundations. You're called to dig deeper and learn more and become stronger as disciples of Christ. Now, that's not the author telling those people that they need to forget the foundations upon which their faith is built. It's the author saying they need to build upon the foundation of which their faith is built. And if you're new to this journey we call the Christian faith, the author is not telling you that you don't need to learn the foundation. We certainly need to understand what it means to be a Christian and why we do the things we do. But the author is reminding us that that's the starting line, 
not the finish of our journey. It's the beginning of a trip that covers our entire lives as Christians. The author is reminding us that you don't graduate college just because you passed the 101 exam. It is the beginning, not the end. Then, in those final verses we read, the author is telling us why we should want to grow as disciples of Christ. Because God can't force us to grow. God can't force us closer to him. It's a choice that we all make individually in our lives for the reasons explained in Hebrews. There at the end. And we want each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end. So that you may not become sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The promises that God has long offered his followers. The promise that our own lives will be changed. When we choose to follow God and we choose to let Christ into our life, we start a new life. We begin living in a different way. We look at the world through new lenses. But we're also promised that through our discipleship and through our works, we will have the opportunities to change other people's lives. And so the call we find in Hebrews is to grow so confident in our own faith that we are willing to share it with others and help them grow in theirs. Hear that one more time. The call we see in Hebrews is to grow so confident in our faith that we share it with others and help them grow in theirs. Now that might sound like a really lofty and hard to achieve goal. That may even seem overwhelming at times, and I understand that. But I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to see this in action last week. Last Wednesday, I was in my office writing out this sermon and kind of putting words on paper. And I looked out of my window, and I saw a member of our staff with a person that I didn't recognize. And at first I thought, well, maybe they're connected to the church in some way. There's still some faces that after six months I don't have a name for yet. But then I recognized that that staff member was finding every piece of paper that had anything printed on it in the church and handing it to this family. Everything about who we are and what we do and what our schedule is and the way in which we worship and the community that we have built. And so I assumed, I thought fairly safely, that these were new people trying to connect to this congregation. And then that family got the grand tour. They came here to the chapel. They went to the sanctuary. They went upstairs and downstairs. And I think by the end of it, they probably knew their way around the basement better than I do. After the tour, they came back to the celebration room and staff members were invited out to meet them and talk to them and greet them. And after maybe 30 or 45 minutes, they kind of smiled and went on their way. And that staff member came into my office. And so I asked, quite simply, who, who were they? Family, friends, neighbors? And I asked the question in that way because those are the groups that I'm comfortable inviting to church. Family, friends, or neighbors. The staff member said, oh, no. Um, they were strangers. Well, at least until this morning. I met them at the Verizon Wireless store. We started to talk, and I decided to invite them to church. And I gave that member of our staff a patented Austin Harris, I don't believe you face. And I asked again for confirmation, you met them at the phone store? He said, yeah. Uh, walked in to get my phone fixed. We started talking. And at the end of our conversations, I knew that I wanted to invite them to the church to learn about this congregation. I invited them to our June 3rd celebration. That way they could meet the whole church and have fun with our church family, which is exactly why we changed up our summer worship schedule in the first place. We'd have opportunities to invite people to this church to know who we are. The staff member said, and I think they're coming back. They seemed really excited about who we are and what we do. And as I looked around my office to find my jaw and reattach it to my face, I realized that in those moments, at that time, the staff member was doing exactly what we are called to do as disciples of Christ. They were confident enough in their faith that they shared it with others and helped them grow in theirs. And they answered the call we find in Hebrews, but they answered the call that we also find in Paul's letter to the Romans. Turn again once more to Romans 10, verses 14 and 15. They'll be on the screen here. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to pro proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, I'm not one to say that anyone on our staff has beautiful feet, least of which Allison. Um, but in that moment, that staff member was being a fantastic disciple of Christ. 
And I can tell you that there's been a lot of growth for that staff member over the years. When they first started their Christian journey, they would not have been confident enough to walk into a phone store, meet a stranger, talk to that stranger, and at the end of that conversation, invite them to this church. But they have grown so confident in their faith that they shared it with someone new and helped that person and their family grow in theirs. And so in doing that, they have inherited those promises that God offers. Their life has been changed, and now they've had the opportunity to change lives of the people around them. So maybe you're sitting out in the congregation saying, okay, Austin, I get it. I'm supposed to grow as a Christian. I understand that, but I don't know what's next. I try to look ahead, and I just don't see what the next step on this journey for me is. Or maybe you hear this and you say, well, Austin, I've been a Christian for a very, very long time. I do all these things. I invite people to church. I'm a good steward to my neighbors. Certainly, there's no more growth left for me. Maybe you're sitting out there and saying, I have an idea for what growth might be, but it's a really big step, and I'm not sure how I get from here to there. I can't figure it out. I can promise you, though, that whatever you're thinking right now, there is a next step for you. As Christians, we are called to grow not just once and not just in a few seasons of our lives, but continuously. We never get to retire from being disciples of Christ. I'm sorry to tell you that there will never be a Sunday in which after church we take you into the conference room, wheel out the ice cream cake, thank you for 45 years of dedicated service to the corporation, and then hand you a silver wristwatch. That's not what you have signed up for here at Topeka First United Methodist Church. We are all called to grow, no matter where we are at on our Christian journey. Now, I can't invite you all to my office and pull out my magical crystal ball and tell you what that growth will be and what the next steps in your journey might look like. But I believe, because we're told through the scripture, that if we concentrate on that growth and we communicate with God through prayer and conversation and we work with the people around us, we will figure out what that looks like. I did a lot of that self-reflection this week as I wrote this sermon. And so I kind of figured out that the next steps don't have to be big and overwhelming. Many times they're small and easily doable. So maybe like me, you're really good at praying when life is hard. When you need something from God, you are right there all the time talking to him. But when life is going well, well, you get busy and you get distracted and that conversation gets placed on the back burner a little bit. There's room to grow there as a Christian. Maybe like me, you see Christ's call in the Bible to love people unconditionally and to welcome your neighbors and to be a steward of his light unto the world. And maybe you're not angry with people, but to love everyone well, that's a really big bite to chew. That's hard to do. There's room to grow there as a Christian, as sharing God's love with the people around us. Maybe like me, there are pieces of the Bible that you open and you read and they still confuse you. And they don't influence your faith. You don't understand what they mean or how to read it or what to do with the information it's sharing. But you've never taken the time to study it or delve into it or ask questions about that text. Because we're busy. Life happens. We fill up our calendar. And that becomes a secondary focus. Well, there's room to grow there as a Christian. And maybe, like me, most days when you walk into a phone store, you're not confident enough in your faith to invite a stranger to come to church and to know that God loves them. Well, there's certainly room to grow there as Christians. I know that that growth can seem difficult and obstacles crop up, but we can be confident as we grow as disciples that God goes with us wherever we might go. Wherever this journey takes us, God is there with us. There's nowhere we can go that he cannot reach. The Holy Spirit, that was with Jesus and with the apostles and with John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, is still here with us today. And we can gain courage and confidence and strength through the power that they give us. But we also know that we take these journeys together. We join this church, we come together as a community of Christ, so we don't have to walk our Christian journey alone. And so being a disciple is a lot like climbing a mountain. Wherever you are at on the path, there is someone in front of you who can reach back and give you a hand, and there is someone behind you who is just waiting for you to turn around and to see them and to invite them onto the path. We walk this journey together as a congregation and as individuals. We have connected to this church people who have been Christians for over 50 years, and we have people connected to this church who were just baptized as babies or just confirmed as youth or are adults who are just now starting to experience God in new ways. We have connected to this church clergy who have spent their lives in service to Christ. We have people who are trying to become clergy, and we have people who just recently came to know that there is a God that loves them. Wherever you are at as a Christian and wherever you are at in this life, 
there is a next step. There is growth for us, both as individuals and a congregation. I said at the beginning that I believe we do great work here at Topeka First. I have seen in my six months here incredible and missional hearts pouring out into this community service that sometimes is almost unbelievable. We connect very well, and we grow very well, and we serve very well, and I believe that this congregation increasingly exists for the good of the city. But I also know that we can do more. As a congregation, as a body of Christ, we can continue to grow so we can connect more and we can grow more and we can serve more. And as a community, we can do more for the good of the city. And if we, as individuals and as a church, choose to walk this walk and grow with Christ, we will inherit those promises that our lives and that this church will change and that the lives of the people around us will change too. And I can think of no better reason to continue to grow as a disciple of Christ than the opportunity to make someone else's life better. Will you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, we come here today because we want to be like you. We come into this space, God, and we try to wrap our heads around the things you do and the way in which you work in our lives and the way in which we, as your disciples, are supposed to share your word with the world around us. And God, sometimes that feels overwhelming and difficult and out of reach. But God, we know that even in those moments, you're there, walking right along beside us, giving us the strength and the confidence to be your light in the world. And so God, we know that we are called to grow, and we know that you go with us wherever we are. And so God, we pray that in the coming weeks and months and years, we may continue to grow deeper as disciples of Christ so that we may become so confident in our own faith that we share it with others and help them grow in theirs. It's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, praise band, and thank you all for clapping along. Uh, as I walked around this week, I kept noticing in the little kitchen out by the celebration room that we as a staff used to uh, microwave our frozen lunches and get coffee in the morning, uh, this mug sitting on top of the microwave throughout the week. And I thought, well, there's a quote on it that I really love that I want to share during the benediction. And so I was going to use it. And I walked in this morning and I find Michael holding it, drinking coffee out of it, because it's his mug that he forgot here last Sunday. And I said, oh, Michael... I was going to use that as a sermon prop, which means it's property of the church now. And the good Methodist Michael is, he took it, poured his coffee into a new cup, handed me it, and said, I will get it next Sunday. So we have our cup and our quote. It's a quote from John Wesley, one of his more famous, and I think it perfectly captures the way in which we are supposed to live as Christians. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. John Wesley was a giant of the Christian faith, yet he knew that he never got to retire from growing as a Christian. He did all the good he could, everywhere he could, for as long as he could, and we are called to the same thing today. So go from this place confident in the glory and the grace and the love of God that is given to you freely, and take that love and take that glory and be the light of Christ in the world and live your lives in such a way that all who see you might just want to know your God. Go in peace always. Amen. <laughs>